Thank you, Brother Lauter. Now it's my privilege to invite Brother Ron Ford to address us. Part one, Nicodemus, who came by night. Brother Chairman and my dear brethren and sisters and friends and young people, once again, for those of you who were to point him, we bring the fraternal greetings of Lynn and myself and the East Torrens Ecclesia in Adelaide, Australia. And we're going to consider this weekend these encounters with the Lord Jesus Christ. We're going to look at how Jesus confronts people and affects people. We're going to look at five separate incidents in the life of Christ where people came in contact with the Lord Jesus and went away greatly changed by that impact. And the Lord must have an impact on us as we go through life. You know, concerning Peter and John, they were two of the twelve disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ who were greatly impacted by their association with the Lord Jesus Christ. It says in Acts chapter 4 and verse 13 that when they were placed in front of the Jewish Sanhedrin, that is the Jewish rulers, put on trial, it says when they saw the boldness of Peter and John, we're going to see in one of our latest studies how Peter and John took a long time to develop that boldness. They perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant men. So these were just fishermen. They had no education in the things of the law and the, the great things that the rulers studied. But it says they marveled at them and they took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus. And they could see in Peter and John that there had been a very dramatic impact made upon those humble fishermen by their association with the Lord Jesus Christ. We're going to hopefully experience that same touching power from the Lord Jesus Christ in our lives. Now the background to John 3 that we've read this evening is right at the end of the first 12 months of the Lord's ministry. And we have this man Nicodemus to consider. Nicodemus, the one who came by night. We're going to see one of the great reversals and one of the great changes that are made in a human life. Jesus had now been active for some time, particularly in the northern part of the land in Galilee. The Pharisees and the scribes had sent a delegation up to Galilee to investigate this amazing new teacher who was causing such a sensation in the region of Galilee. And they came back totally unable to explain the miracles that he did, or to cope with the words that he spoke and the questions he asked. You can only imagine the consternation in Jerusalem that one day he might come to their particular part of the land. And so he did. And this was the first Passover in Jerusalem. He had come and he continued to do the same miracles in Jerusalem. You see in verse 23, many believed on his name when they saw the miracles which he did. And he's now right on their patch. He's on their home ground. He's working in their streets, in their temple. And he was generating a great wave of popularity from the people. Even worse than that, when you go back to chapter 2 and verse 15 of John, we find that the Lord had taken this scourge and driven out all the traders in the temple. It was quite a chaotic scene, you can imagine, can't you? He drove out the sheep and the, and the oxen that were there, overturned the tables of the money changers, released all the doves that were in cages, and drove them all out with a whip. He disrupted their money-making process in the temple. He said to them, you have corrupted God's house and made it a den of thieves. And he was to do that twice in his ministry, once on this occasion, once towards the end of the three and a half years. Let me just point out some, something about this which is quite remarkable. No one ever challenged Jesus as to why he had done that. Even when they were searching desperately for some excuse to put him to death, after three and a half years, this was not raised as a charge against him. There was no charge of blasphemy of the temple. There was no charge of upsetting the religious worship that was going on there. This was never raised by anybody against Jesus on a charge of desecration of the temple. You see, they all knew what a rotten trade was going on in the temple. Just for those of you who don't know what was happening in the temple, the Jewish leadership, particularly the Sadducees and the Pharisees, had set up a scheme that you had to buy animals from them to sacrifice. They had 
They had, would get animals and they would make sure they were acceptable for sacrifice, but you had to largely buy their animals. But to buy those animals, you had to have temple money. So your money was changed by them at a very high exchange rate into temple money, and then you bought their animals, and they were making a profit at every stage of the process. And they knew that that was a corrupt trade. It was just playing upon people's desire to worship. And so when Jesus twice drove them out and overturned that trade, nobody ever criticised him for him. They knew that they were really making it a den of thieves. And you can imagine having done that to their trade in the temple. And and the people, in verse 23, the people following him greatly because of the miracles that he did, how upset the rulers of the Jews would have been, that here he was in their city, in their temple, taking away their crowds, their people, and getting such a following. And they were faced with the fact that there were miracles happening in Jerusalem at this time that were undeniable. And any reasoning person, when they see miracles being done, is is drawn to certain conclusions, but conclusions for them that were not very palatable, things they did not want to accept. If a man is doing that sort of miracles, then God must be working through him. And why is God working through him and not through us? So you see, they were faced with a problem concerning Jesus. As usual, within the ranks of the ruling class in Israel, there were always divisions between Pharisees and Sadducees and the Herodians and others. Some of them, of course, were totally opposed to recognising any of the miracles of Jesus and did nothing but simply plot his death. But others decided they had to follow reason and do something about this miracle worker. They were smart enough to see that you can't oppose the power of God. You know, later on in the book of Acts, when Peter and John were doing miracles, Gamaliel stood up, and he was another great teacher in Israel, a very old man at that stage. And he said, leave them alone. You don't know if you're opposing God. And there were enough rulers at this particular time, right at the start of Jesus' ministry, ministry that had the sense to say this man is doing miracles, God must be with him. But you see the point of the the visit of Nicodemus was that they had decided that the best way to deal with Jesus was to get him on board. You see if, if Jesus was to set up what everybody expected which was a Jewish kingdom, he was going to remove the Romans they thought. And he was a man that had the power, obviously, at his hands, that he could do that. Well, if Jesus was going to establish a Jewish kingdom, then he would need people like themselves to rule that kingdom for him. Obviously, they, as the chief rulers of the nation at this time, would be somewhere, very important places in the new kingdom that Jesus might set up. And their whole approach, through Nicodemus, is based upon their estimation of their own importance. They just couldn't see that a kingdom could be set up in the Jewish nation without them. Let's just pick up John's background to what happens with Nicodemus. I want you to notice, again, we have a very clear case here of the chapter division being in the wrong place. I've said it before and I'll say it again. Chapter divisions, except in the Psalms, are not part of the divine inspiration. They were put in by the translators to to break the Bible into readable sections. Most of them are reasonably good, but some of them are in the wrong place, and this is another one of them. The chapter division between chapter 2 and 3 should be after chapter 2 and verse 22. Verse 23 onwards is actually part of chapter 3. And and I I say this because we do tend to read the Bible in chapters, and sometimes we're just missing the theme that is there. And the theme is there at the end of chapter 2. The popularity of Jesus, and here is the theme. The whole theme of this section between John 2 verse 23 and chapter 3 verse 21 is the battle between the flesh and the spirit. The terms that John uses are the terms man, flesh, darkness and evil deeds. They are the things of the flesh. The things of the spirit are being born from above, being born of water and spirit, spirit being born again, born of the spirit, the light and the deeds of God. And that's the contrast that is being made here in John chapter 3. And so it's very important to pick up the theme. Now we pick up the theme in chapter 2 and verse 23. Right at the end, 
Many believed on Jesus when they saw the miracles which he did. But Jesus did not commit himself unto them. Now it's not hard to believe in somebody doing miracles. If a man was going around healing people, right down the street as he went, touching this one and touching that one, and healing people of diseases, then you would easily follow such a man. And the crowd did that. He was very popular very quickly. But it says he did not commit himself. And the words mean he did not trust himself to them. Jesus knew that crowds are always very fickle. He knew men, that men are basically selfish and shallow. And so it says in verse 25, why Jesus did not trust them. He needed not that any should testify of man, for he knew what was in man. Now that's not there to tell us that Jesus could read human minds, even though he could obviously do that. What it's saying was that Jesus was under no illusions, no misconceptions, what human nature is really like. You see, particularly a crowd mentality is easily swayed. This same crowd, three years later, were crying out, crucify him, crucify him. We have no king but Caesar, we want Barabbas. The same crowd. And Jesus knew that people are capable of being so fickle and so shallow. By the end of John 6, only a year later, the crowd had virtually disappeared. When Jesus said, I am not going to set up my kingdom now, my words are about the last days, not about a kingdom right now. It says they all left him and went away. And he was down just to the twelve. And the crowd was gone. And crowds are like that. A crowd mentality is a very, very dangerous and a very shallow thing. Jesus was after individuals who would personally think about the words that he spake in depth. So Jesus did not need anyone to tell him about what human nature is like. He understood it extremely well. And so the theme that we have here is man. He knew what was in man. Ignore the chapter division and go straight into chapter 3. There was a man. There was a person that Jesus perfectly understood. A man that came to him, he could read his mind, he knew his motives, and he knew exactly where he was coming from. And so we have this man, and what a man he was. Nicodemus, let's just tally up some of the things we know about Nicodemus. Well, everything about this man is prestigious, everything about him is important. His name means victorious over the people, which is... Quite some title, isn't it? The Pharisees and the rulers of the Jews had a very strict pecking order. There was a tree of popularity, there was a tree of importance you could climb up. And they were very conscious of their position in that order. You might remember Galatians 1 verse 14, the Apostle Paul said that when he was a Pharisee, he says, I exceeded above all my fellows in the Jewish religion. Paul was the top scholar in his class of the Jewish religion. They were very conscious of their status. Now look what it says about him in verse 10. It says, the teacher of Israel. Now read verse 10 carefully. Jesus said, art thou a master? Now there is there what we call a definite article. It should be the teacher or the leader. The master of Israel. The diagot has the teacher of Israel. But I want you to notice the word the is most important there. There are not several teachers of Israel or leaders or masters of Israel. There's one master of Israel. And he was it. He was the leading rabbi. He was the one that everybody looked to for guidance in things of interpretation. You just wonder, perhaps 20 years earlier, he had been in the temple when Jesus came and they marveled at his words and his questions. Verse 1 says he was a ruler of the Jews. And the Greek word there is archon. It means he was the first of the Jews. He was the top man. I don't know what terms you use in Africa. In America they say the big cheese. Australia we say the top dog. The big wheel. But he was the top man. He was the ruler of the Jews. And he was very wealthy because later on he donated a lot of quantity of myrinellos for the burial of Jesus. And I believe Nicodemus had come with an offer of compromise to Jesus 
on behalf of the ruling class. They wanted to share the kingdom with him. Now he came by night. In every reference to Nicodemus that we have in the book of John, in every one of them it says he came by night. Isn't that fascinating? That's the divine commentary. That's how God puts a tag on this man, that he's the one who came by night. He first came in the darkness. Why did he come in the dark? Well, Jesus tells us why he came in the dark. In verse 20, everyone that doeth evil hateth the light. He would not approach Jesus in the street during the day because the crowd might see that he was compromising with Jesus. No, he wanted to make a secret pact with Jesus in the darkness. He didn't want to come to the light lest his deeds be reproved. And so he came by night. And that's the lesson Jesus makes. But it's interesting, isn't it, that in all of those records, that's the tag that God puts on Nicodemus. He first came by night. And in the book of Lives, where God records the the lives and the doings of his saints, I wonder how each one of us is recorded. What might be God's summary of you and of me? I'm going to give you a challenge now, something to think about when you go to bed tonight and perhaps we can discuss over breakfast in the morning. What is it that might be written in the book of Lives about you. Just think of a little Bible summation. You know, it might be Mozart and a few words after it. What would God say of you? God said Nicodemus, he came by night. That was the characteristic of the man that God noted. Well, I want you to think of two things. One, to think of what you would like God to have in the book of lives and what might actually be there. And we'll share the first one and you can let your conscience play on the second one. But that's a challenge between now and breakfast time. What is it, think of a Bible summation that might apply to you. I've got one that I hope might apply to me. And if you ask me, I might share it with you. But I've got the second one as well. So there's a challenge. Something to think about when you put your head on the pillow tonight. And so the offer begins. This is the words of Nicodemus in verse 2. And he says this, Rabbi, Now that was an enormous concession on the part of a Jewish ruler. They did not normally normally call any man rabbi who had not spent years in the academies in Jerusalem. It was normal for a man to go through many, many years of sitting at the feet of the great teachers like Gamaliel before anyone was given the title of rabbi. So that was a great concession to call Jesus rabbi. They knew his words and his miracles were irrefutable. And then notice the next words. We know. This was not a private approach, was it? He was there representing many rulers. Just come across to John 12 and verse 42. There were not a few of these rulers that believed in Jesus. John 12 verse 42. Nevertheless, among the chief rulers also many believed on him. But because of the Pharisees, They did not confess him. So there was quite a considerable number of people amongst the ruling classes of the Jews who had already convicted themselves that Jesus was from from God in some way. But they were too scared to come out into the light and to say it publicly because of their reputation. And there's a lesson there for us, isn't there? So often in life, and sometimes in ecclesial life, we are pressured into silence when we should speak up. We fail to take action, then we should take action to do what is right. We are sometimes too concerned about our prestige, our reputation, to speak up when we should. And Nicodemus was like that, and so were the others. We know, he says, that you are a teacher come from God. The Greek actually reads like this, we know that from God your teaching comes. That's the obvious conclusion. If the man is doing miracles, if the power of God is being demonstrated by his hands, then his words must also be from God. But then there's a small put down in the next words. For no man. We can't understand you, says Nicodemus. You're just a man like us. 
but you're doing these miracles. And Jesus was to pick him up on that. Just have a look down at verse 18. Jesus said this, He that believeth on him, that is the Son that God sent into the world, he that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already, because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And Jesus had made it very plain that he was God's Son. But they kept saying, well, he's just a man like us, but he can do miracles. Except God be with him at the end of verse 2. And that's almost God with us, but not quite. God is with him in some way. And they were hedging their bets. You see, like all Jews, the rulers were in expectation of a Messiah that would come. A king of the Jews who perhaps would throw off the Romans. And here was a man, a miracle worker, with the power to do just that. And the people were following him. He had the courage to cleanse the temple. But they felt that if the kingdom was coming by this power, then he would need them. He would need their influence and their cloud and their teaching to to establish that kingdom amongst the nation. And that's as far as Jesus let him get. How wrong they were. There's no doubt that the opening lines of flattery had been carefully structured and would now be followed by a generous offer to share power with Jesus when the kingdom was set up. And then we come to verse 3, and Jesus cuts him short. And Jesus, as he so often does, answers the motive behind the opening statement and says, Nicodemus, you won't even be in the kingdom I'm going to set up. Now Jesus, Nicodemus had not yet even mentioned the kingdom, but Jesus knew where he was heading. This flattery he just got in verse 2 was all about setting up for the offer to share the kingdom with him. And, and Jesus just cuts him short and derails his speech and says, Nicodemus, Nicodemus, verily, verily, and that means truthfully, truthfully. You find the same declarations in verse 5 and verse 11. Truthfully, truthfully, I say to you, I'm not interested in your speech, Nicodemus. I am talking to you. I'm not even interested in the rulers that have sent you, Nicodemus. I'm talking to you as a person, Nicodemus. You get the same in verse 5. I say unto you, unto thee, Nicodemus. This is about your salvation, not the kingdom, not the rulership. It's about your salvation. It's personal between you and God. Nicodemus. Except the man be born again, and you've got a margin of have be born from above. Unless a man is born above, he cannot see, and it's the same word as know in verse 2 that Nicodemus used. He cannot know the kingdom of God. He will not be there. You see, you see Nicodemus said, we know you've come from God. And Jesus says, you won't even know the kingdom you're, you're thinking about unless you are born from above. Now how shattering would that be to Nicodemus? Coming along with a what he thought was a generous offer to share the kingdom, to be suddenly told that he might not even get into the kingdom, that he might not be there. We need to understand what a challenge this was to the Jewish mindset. Now we say the Jewish mindset because they did have a very particular and peculiar idea about themselves. See, Jesus said, you must be born from above. You must have a new mind that comes from God. The Jews put so much store in their natural birth and their natural descent. How how demoralizing to be told that you've got to be born from above when they are so confident in the fact that they were born children of Abraham. You see, they boasted to Jesus in John chapter 8, we be not born of fornication. As if that impacted on a child's standing with God. They said, we have Abraham to our father, we are not the uncircumcised, we are not the unclean, we are not dogs of the Gentiles. And Jews had this mindset that somehow being born a Jew made them different and better than everybody else. 
Genealogies matter. They kept the great record of their family tree. Paul would say that he was the son of a Pharisee of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin. Paul did not come from one of those terrible northern tribes that went into apostasy. No, I'm from the southern tribe, said Paul. He was very conscious of the good tribe he came from. All of those things, said Paul, were gain to the Jewish mind. The better the tribe you came from, the better the family you came from, the more the further back your genealogy went, well, the more of a Jew you were, and therefore much better than everybody else, including the Gentiles. In John chapter 8, they said to Jesus, we are free. Rather a funny thing to say when they are under the yoke of the Romans, but you see, they thought that they were God's children, God's kingdom. And we have to understand that Jewish mindset, that somehow they were different to all other men. And Jesus said, if you're not born from above, you won't even be in the kingdom. Now you think how Nicodemus would have been totally puzzled by this. He was probably some 70 years old about this time because normally it took that long to get the job that he had. He was the teacher of Israel. He was used to teaching everybody else, not used to being told. Especially such blunt truths about himself. It would have been very hard for a man of such prestige to accept the need for change. And so he responds at the enormity of it in verse 7. And Jesus says, marvel not. Or sorry, he responds in verse 4. Nicodemus said to him, how can a man be born when he is old like me, said Nicodemus. You're telling me to be born again and I'm, I'm 70 years old. You see, he couldn't understand that at all, could he? He was thinking in natural terms. Can he enter the second time in his mother's womb and be born? And he's now struggling with what Jesus is trying to say. Do I have to start again in life? Have I wasted all my life? Well, Nicodemus had a real problem, didn't he? You can imagine that in his mind he's seeing himself going back to the other rulers who were waiting the outcome of this discussion and saying, well, look, um, I didn't get very far with the offer. I actually found out I've got to be born again, that I've got to start my life all over again. You can see how Nicodemus was struggling with the implications of what he just heard. Now what did Jesus mean in verse 3 when he said, you've got to be born from above? I want to just say a few things about this because sometimes we, we tend to complicate this phrase, being born of water and of spirit. You see in the Greek, there's a particular Greek form of words where you describe the same thing by using two different ways. Just some examples, and it's common in the Hebrew as well. But just dual expressions of the one item, philosophy and vain deceit, they are both the same thing. Judgment and righteousness go together. The holy one and the just. That world and the resurrection from the dead, it's, it's the same concept being described in two different varied forms. The Holy Spirit and fire are often put together. And when the Holy Spirit came to the apostles, it came in the symbol of tongues of fire. So you get this idea in the Greek of, of two things being described by two uh, terms that are compatible. So we're not talking about two different births. You know, we don't get baptised and have a birth of water and a birth of the Spirit. What happens in baptism is that we are born of the Spirit, our mind is changed. We take in the thinking of God, we become a new creature by the way that we think. And baptism is the first symbol of obedience. Look what it says in Corinthians. You know, baptism is nothing more than an outward sign that a change has taken place inside. Such were some of you. You were washed and sanctified. You were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. Peter says, The like figure of baptism doth also save us. Not the putting away of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God. So you see, baptism is, is the seal, it's the symbol. It's the moment then we say that we have taken on, on the responsibility of the new mind that we have developed by reading and understanding the word of God. Now, the Jews did not practice baptism for Jews. The only time the Jews baptised somebody was when a Gentile decided to become a Jew. When they wanted to join the hope of Israel, they would baptise the Gentile and circumcise 
any males, that they want to become, become Jews. Fascinatingly enough, that part of every Jewish ceremony for the baptism of Gentiles included the words, you are now as a newborn child. So Jesus was picking up something from their own ceremonies for Gentiles to come become Jews. And says to Nicodemus, you have to go through a similar process. The Pharisees came to watch John baptising people in Jordan but the record very clearly says they did not submit to John's baptism. They did not see the need of repentance. You see, the Jews thought they had God on their side already. They did not understand the need for baptism. Paul said in, in, Philippi, in, in Acts, if you have believed with all your heart, you may be baptised. And we know that baptism is absolutely useless unless there has been a change of heart, a change of thinking. A new mind developed. A person going into the water without that new mind is wet, not saved. The Lord's talking about a new starting lot, a new beginning. And the object of the water is to make a public confession that all flesh is grass and that we have followed the mind of God and we want to be part of the work of God. And baptism is a humiliating process to the natural man. God says it's the first act of obedience of the new mind. So Nicodemus really struggles with that. How can a man be born again? He's still on the natural plane. He just can't get his head around where Jesus is coming from. Well, Jesus then gives him a an interesting little exposition of what the spirit is like. Verse 8, except a man be born of water and of the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of, of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. And Jesus makes this very clear distinction. We are either, either flesh or spirit. The spirit is the mind of God. The flesh is the natural mind. It might be highly educated, very intelligent, but if it's not thinking like God, it is flesh. It's born of the flesh and it is flesh. Therefore he says in verse 7, Nicodemus, marvel not, I said, that you must be born again because you're either one or the other and the fact that you've come by night indicates to me that you hate the light, that you're still in darkness. And I say you must be born from above. Then we have this little... Amazing little thing that happens in verse 8. The wind. The wind. Now, I get a, a feeling here that perhaps right at that moment, in the darkness, the wind started to stir the trees. And Jesus said to Nicodemus, he said, let me explain to you what the Spirit is like. The wind bloweth where it listeth. Wherever the wind wants to go, it goes. And you hear it, you see the trees bend, but you can't tell when it came from, nor where it's going. And where there's a swirling breeze, you don't know. It might be blowing the tree that way, you don't know where it's going to go next. And it's like that. The wind is something you can feel, you know the impact, but you don't actually see it. And Jesus said, so is everyone that is born of the Spirit. And let's just explain those words a little clearer. This is the words of Brother John Thomas who translated the passage this way. The Spirit breathes where he pleased and thou hearest his voice but knowest not whence he comes or whither he leads. In like manner is everyone that is begotten of the Spirit. Now the reason Brother Thomas translates the word wind there in verse 8 as the Spirit is because of the 19 times that that word occurs in the New Testament um, it's actually translated only in this place, where he says the sound thereof, sorry, the sound thereof, it's actually the voice of the Spirit, and that's where he gets this, now here is his voice. So the sound is the voice, and that's the only time where it's translated as sound and not voice. But see, what Jesus is saying is the power of the Spirit moves things. It has an impact, but it's not perceived by the natural man. And Nicodemus your peers, the other rulers that have sent you, 
They will hear you, but they will not understand you. And we're going to see that's exactly what happened. Let me just explain that in the words of Scripture. The words of the first of Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14 and 15 from the Diagon. Now an animal man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, and he is not able to understand, because they are spiritually examined. So to understand the words of God, you need to be thinking in tune with God. You've got to have a mind that is framed by the words and the understanding of the character of God. And then the things of the Spirit of God will become clear to you and you will understand other spiritual people. But he goes on to say, but the spiritual man examines indeed all things. So somebody who is in tune with God, somebody who understands the way that God sees the world can accurately assess the world as it really is. He examines all things. But it's not understood by the natural man. And there will always be this degree of people not being being able to understand why we believe the things we do and why we do the things that we do. Because they are not natural. They are dictated by the mind of God. You know, Jesus says this to Nicodemus, Nicodemus, you've got to be prepared to accept the fact that when you go back and try and explain yourself to your fellows, they will hear you like the wind going through the trees. But they won't have any idea what you're talking about. Be prepared for that, Nicodemus. And Nicodemus is still confused in verse 9. How can these things be? He's absolutely staggering under the, under the things he's hearing. And Jesus says this, in verse 11, We speak. Now who's the we here? Well, it's God, it's Christ, and it's John. You know, Nicodemus started with the words, we know. Jesus says, we speak that we do know. You see, they were far more convicted than Nicodemus and his friends were. We speak that we do know and testify that we have seen. And you don't receive our witness. We've been out there doing miracles. We've been saying the words of God and you don't understand them and you don't receive them. And in verse 12, Nicodemus, if I have told you earthly things and you believe not, how on earth are you going to believe if I tell you of heavenly things? Nicodemus, there are concepts that I need to talk to you about that are far, far more deep and and, and near the mind of God than you've ever heard. And I'm telling you simple facts about flesh and spirit and you don't get the point. What if I start telling you really deep things, Nicodemus? You're a master of Israel. Why don't you know these things? And you see, he's humbling the man. He's shattering his self-confidence. Well, verse 13 is really interesting, isn't it? In verse 13, And no man hath ascended up to heaven. Now that's not talking literally about the fact that no one goes to heaven because you know we know that as a fact from other parts of the Bible. What Jesus is saying is that no earthly thinker, you know, just connected back to chapter 2, verse 25, he knew what was in men. No earthly thinker has ascended to heavenly places. You see, if you've still got a mind that is in the thinking of the flesh, if you've still got a mind that has not been trained in the deep things of the Spirit of God, you will never understand heavenly things. But Jesus says, He that came down from heaven, which of course was himself, his divine origins, his education from God, even the Son of Man, which is in heaven, Now, Jesus wasn't literally in heaven, wasn't he? He was standing there with Nicodemus in the streets of Jerusalem. So we're talking here about heaven and earth in the sense of are you in heaven, in heavenly places with the thinking of God or are you standing there with Nicodemus in the flesh, a man? You see, that's what Jesus is saying. No natural thinker can get into the heavenly places. But if your mind is a mind that has come down from God like mine, then you will live in that spiritual realm. You will understand the things of God. For example, you will know what the kingdom of God is going to be. You will know what a new birth into Christ means. You'll understand the grace of God. You'll understand the gospel is going to go to the Gentiles. 
you'll understand the process of the atonement. You'll know that the law of Moses is coming to an end. That the order of Melchizedek is going to be established. There are heavenly things, Nicodemus, that if I tried to tell you now, you would even be more confused. And so he says, no natural thinking, Nicodemus, can ever get their head around the heavenly things. You have to be born from above first, and then you will understand heavenly things. So you see, no human can fully and totally comprehend God. You know, Jesus was giving us the challenge of getting into that state of thinking in heavenly terms. Now, he actually gives Nicodemus a lesson in Bible Bible reading. I want you to come, well, before we do, just look at what he says now in verse 14. He just goes straight on. Nicodemus is standing there shaking his head and saying, how can these things be? And Jesus said, well, let me give you a simple Sunday school lesson, Nicodemus, and see what you make of this one. As Moses was lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whomsoever believeth on him should not perish but have eternal life. Just come back to Numbers 21. Let's look at the incident that Jesus is referring to. So he says to Nicodemus, well, let me just ask you a question on a simple Sunday school story that you know from your law. Now you're the teacher of Israel, Nicodemus. Can you understand the lesson, the simple lesson from Numbers 21 about the serpent on the pole? Now I think we hopefully know the story fairly well. What happened is the children of Israel were murmuring against Moses. Numbers 21. It says there, in verse 5, the people spake against God and against Moses and they accused God and Moses of bringing him out in the wilderness to kill them. There was no water. There was no food. And they got disgruntled. And then in verse 6, and this is what we want to notice, And Yahweh sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people, and much people of Israel died. So, very simply, the power of sin, you know, the, the, the evil of murmuring had shown that they were worthy of death. And everybody is subject to the danger of death. If a serpent bites them, then they will die. And many people had had died. So how can this problem be solved? Well, there was nothing the law could do for the bite of a serpent. There was nothing in the law of Moses that provided for a situation like this. And so the people came to Moses and they said, we have sinned. They saw that they were wrong in what they had done. We've spoken against Yahweh. We've spoken against you. Pray to Yahweh. They take away the serpent from us. And Moses prayed for the people. So you see, they were under the power of the serpent. The power of sin was killing everybody. The law has no solution. A new way of salvation was needed. And God told Moses what to do. Verse 8. Make thee a fiery serpent, set it upon a pole, and it shall come to pass that everyone that is bitten, when he looketh upon it, shall live. And Moses made a serpent of brass and put it upon a pole. And you can see it there. A serpent of brass. So, the identical serpent to the one that was biting them. A fiery serpent bit them. It had to be a fiery serpent made of brass, put on the pole. And if people looked at that, those that had been bitten would live. So there was a very simple Sunday school story. But look at what it says there. In verse 8, everyone that is bitten, when you look upon it, verse 9, If it had bitten any man, when he beheld the serpent of brass, he could live. So just keep those words very, very much marked in your mind. Everyone that looks, everyone that is bitten, any man. Come back to John chapter 3 and see what the Lord now says to Nicodemus. (coughs) And he says, as the... Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. There has to be a crucifixion, Nicodemus, of the Son of Man, the serpent on the pole. It's got to happen again. That, and here it is, whosoever, Nicodemus, believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God so loved the world, Nicodemus, not just Jews, 
Nicodemus, right back in your law, God was teaching you that salvation would go outside of Israel because anyone that looks, anyone that is bitten, that puts faith in the brazen serpent, the one that God would lift up, the same nature that was killing you had to be crucified. And Nicodemus, whosoever looketh on him, the world that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Do you know, there's a number of things in that passage that are very significant. How we avoid perishing. Twice in those two verses, verse 16 and 17, we have, verse 15 and 16, we have the word, should not perish. And that's what happens to mankind. That's what happens to all flesh unless it is born from above. So Nicodemus, you have to do better than just saying, I'm a man that can do miracles. You have to see that I am not only the Son of God, but I'm the one who will be the serpent on the pole. And you can imagine, can't you, the implications of all of that to the mind of Nicodemus from his own law, from the history of Israel. A lesson perhaps he had never seen. He now understood that it would take the lifting up of a man born of a woman wearing the same nature as, as human nature as everybody else that was dying by sin. And by that man being lifted up, salvation would come to the world, not just to Jews. And so Jesus says, God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world, Nicodemus, might be saved through him. This is not limited to you and your race. You, Nicodemus, well, you're still stumbling around in the dark. Your deeds are evil. You don't come to the light. In verse 21, He that doeth truth cometh to the light, that his deeds may be manifest, that they are wrought in God. So we avoid perishing by being born from above, taking in the mind of God, obeying God in baptism, which is being born of water and spirit, being born of the spirit and being born again. All of those are indications of the new life, the new commitment we make to God to serve him in the way that is required. But what of Nicodemus? Well, come to chapter 7 and verse 47. Nicodemus had time to think about this. Now, this was the Feast of Tabernacles, perhaps about 15 months later. And Jesus again is in Jerusalem and doing miracles that are upsetting the Jews. And in John 7 and verse 47, we find that a delegation had been sent, the temple officers had been sent by the authorities to arrest Jesus and to bring him back to the authorities. And we find in verse 40 and 45, then came the officers, these were the temple police, to the chief priests and Pharisees and said to them, and they said, why have you not brought him? We sent you out to arrest him. What sort of police are you? Why didn't you arrest him? And they said, never man spoke like this man. And the words of Jesus had deterred them from their arrest mission. And the Pharisees were pretty upset about that. Then answered the Pharisees said, are you also deceived? Are you crazy? And then in verse 48, they made this statement. Have any of the rulers of the Pharisees believed on him? Oh dear. There was within their midst a group of rulers and Pharisees who had believed that Jesus was doing miracles from God. And now it's going to come into the open. And they said in verse 49, But this people who knoweth not the law are cursed. You are worse than that dumb crowd out there following this miracle worker. None of us have believed in him, said the Pharisees. But oh dear, look at verse 50. Nicodemus bobs up. Nicodemus decides to come out of the darkness into the light. Nicodemus stands up. And this is a meeting of the Assembly of the rulers, the Sanhedrin. And it says, He that came to Jesus by night, being one of them. And all Nicodemus does at this stage is to plead for the right course of action to be taken. You know, they could not condemn a man without giving him a hearing. The law said that. 
Nicodemus said this, Doth our Lord judge any man before it hear him and knoweth what he doeth? And all he was doing was appealing for the right process to be applied. Look at the response he got. They turned on him. This is the master of Israel. Now this is a great lesson here. You know, Nicodemus had been hiding for so long. You can only hide for so long. Eventually he has to try and defend Jesus, even though very, very quietly. And look at the response he gets from his fellows. The derision and the pressure. They answered said unto him, Are you also of Galilee? You know, that would be equivalent to us saying to somebody, Are you also from the slums? You know, Galilee was regarded as the slums of Israel. Are you also from the slums? And they're talking to the master of Israel. And that's what the flesh is like, brethren and sisters. When the flesh is rebuked, it turns nasty. When the flesh is questioned, it gets very bitter. And you can meet the nicest people. They might be good Christians, they might be very good humanists and look after people. But you raise within the matter of God's truth and their responsibility to it. You point out the need for repentance and humbling before God and watch the insults fly. Watch the reaction come. You see, that's what the flesh is like. It's a biting, fiery serpent. And it will, it will strike back. And they do. And they go on and make another mistake. Look and search, for out of Galilee arises no prophet. Well, they were wrong about that, because the prophet Jonah came from Galilee. But of course, they wrote off Jonah as not really being a prophet. You know why? Because he had the nerve to go and preach to Gentiles. Therefore, the Jews tried to write him out. Well, we don't really accept Jonah, because... He went and preached to the Assyrians. Assyrians, of all people. Well, of course, there was going to be a prophet come from Galilee. You know, it says in Isaiah 9, verse 1 and 2, quoted in Matthew, that it might be fulfilled, which is spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying, the land of Zebulun, the land of Naphtali, by the way of the sea, beyond Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, that's where the great light is going to shine in Israel. And that's where Jesus started his ministry, in Galilee. Those that sat in the region, the shadow of death, light is sprung up among them. Jesus would start in Galilee. The light would blaze forth from there. Their own prophets said it would like Galilee would have the privilege of first hearing the words of the Son of God. And that just shows you how these men that kept the law were so, so wrong. And the meeting broke up in disarray. And I'll just say, again, an exhortation based upon that incident. Number one, we see Nicodemus coming into the light, stage by stage. But let us learn from that, brethren and sisters. There is never, ever an excuse for personal insults in time of controversy. We might disagree with somebody. We might have strongly varied opinions. We might have a very heated debate about doctrine or some other subject. But there is never ground for personal insults and abuse. And can I say that many of the Christadelphian chat rooms and chat sites on the internet are a disgrace, not in the fact that the debate is being held, but in the ungodly way that people talk to each other. With the anonymity of cyberspace. And there is no ground for personal insults because somebody disagrees with us. That's what the flesh does. Let's just take a lesson from that. But the light at last. Let's go to John chapter 19. John 19 and verse 39. Jesus has been crucified. The time has come now for Nicodemus to come fully into the light. We don't know whether Nicodemus went to Jesus sometime between the time he was abused by the Sanhedrin and the crucifixion. I don't think he did. Perhaps... It was only when Jesus was lifted up, only when he saw Jesus on the cross, when he saw at last the serpent on the pole for what Jesus had outlined it to be, 
Finally, perhaps then, he was born of the Spirit. And now he declared himself openly. John 19, verse 39. Talking about Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus. Then there came also Nicodemus, which at first came by night to Jesus and brought a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about a hundred pound weight. Now you don't normally keep that in the kitchen cupboard. It was the day of preparation. You could not buy it on that day. Even the women couldn't buy spices until two or three days later. I believe this was Nicodemus' personal funeral um, stuff that he put aside for his own burial. Because he was an old man. And I reckon he went home and he got it out of the cupboard and he says, one thing I can do is to anoint the body of Jesus with all my worldly wealth. And that was very expensive stuff, about a hundred pounds weight. And you can work out how much that's worth. But it was a very, very great deal of money involved in what Nicodemus contributed. But you know, more importantly than the value of what he gave was what he did. Verse 40, then they took the body of Jesus and they took it to the place where there was a garden and they buried it there. So two men carried the body of Jesus through the streets of Jerusalem. You imagine the insults of the fickle crowd. They've been baying for the blood of Jesus Christ. They've been hurling insults. The priests and all the Pharisees lining the way as these two men carried the body of Jesus from, the, from Golgotha to the burial site. The spitting, the jeers. And here is now the teacher of Israel defiling himself with a dead body on the night of the Passover. At a time when his peers would not even go into Pilate's judgment hall lest they be defiled by coming in contact with a Gentile. And here is the teacher of Israel carrying a dead body and embalming it. Reverend and sisters, that's coming into the light, isn't it? And Nicodemus has come to the light at last. You know, the next chapter, go back to John 3 and John 4. The next chapter, and John chapter 4 is placed not in necessarily sequence, but we have this glorious contrast presented in the Bible between Nicodemus and a woman. And God is illustrating the principle that whoever, Nicodemus, whoever, the world, anyone who looks on me in faith, anybody who wants to believe in me, Jew, Gentile, or Samaritan, of course, that were hated by the Jews. Jesus is saying that anybody can come to me. And look at the comparison between these two. Nicodemus was a man. In chapter 4 we have a woman. He came by night, she came at midday. He was a ruler, she was a nobody. He was a ruler of the Jews, she was a Samaritan. He was a Pharisee, she was a sinner. And Nicodemus was told, Nicodemus, you have to learn that God loves the world and not just Jews. And she was told, you've got to learn that salvation is found in the Jewish hope. Isn't that fantastic contrast? And those two records, those two encounters with Christ, are put right alongside of each other to teach the different lessons that they both needed to learn. He needed to learn humility, and that God is far, far greater than thinking of just Jews, and she's got to learn that the hope of Israel is the only way for Gentiles to be saved. And that's just a beautiful comparison between those two characters. Totally different, totally different status, totally different people. And they both had to learn and to be humbled in those things. So what are the lessons we take away from Nicodemus? Well, the lesson of the woman of Samaria is very simple, isn't it? All flesh is grass before God. She was a valley, she was low, and she had to be exalted by Christ. He was a mountain and a hill and he had to be brought low by Christ. And of course that's what the word of God in Christ was to do. Just leave that one go. Let's take the lessons from Nicodemus. It says there, brethren and sisters, that we must be born from above. We must create a new mind. Romans chapter 2, the renovation of your mind. It means throwing out the old, the natural and completely taking in the new furniture of the mind of God. There has to be a change of thinking and the way that we refer to things because now we say, what does God say? God has said is where the mind of the Spirit comes from. 
We cannot properly serve Jesus without walking in the light. We can't be one who comes by night to avoid the scorn of his peers. We cannot hide the fact that we believe that Jesus Christ has come from God and speaks the words of God. We must walk in the light. The mind of the Spirit will not always be understood and certainly will be often misunderstood and often mocked because people just don't understand where we're coming from. Take, for example, our attitude to military service. We do what the commandments of God say. We have our allegiance to the kingdom of God. We cannot put our service in the hands of somebody else to dictate our actions. Do people understand that? No, of course they don't. They think we're crazy. They think we're lacking in patriotism. They think we're cowards. They make all the wrong assumptions about why we do that. It's a classic example of the spirit not being understood. And we must be born again, constantly renewed by the spirit mind. And brethren and sisters, we must change. Nicodemus was an old man. He was the one that taught everybody else. And now he's got to relearn, restart, and humble himself under the mighty hand of God. Let us, brethren and sisters, show that we have made that encounter with Christ. Come out of the light and walk, or come out of the darkness and walk in the light of God's truth.